Hello, hello, hello. Is that okay? I could crouch a little bit, but no, no, right. okay. There we go. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Vinay Arun, and I'm a junior at Tufts University, and I'm a friend of the store. And I'm very, very honored to introduce three wonderful poets tonight. Um, Martin Figura, Helen Ivory, and Mark Vincenz. Uh, Martin Figura's collection and show Whistle were shortlisted for the Ted Hughes Award and won the 2013 Saboteur Award for Best Spoken Word Show. His collections shed from Gatehouse Press and Dr. Zeman's Catastrophe Machine from Cinnamon Press were published in 2016. In 2021, he was Salisbury NHS writer in residence with a pamphlet, My Name is Mercy from Fairacre Press. A second pamphlet from Fairacre Press entitled 16 Sonnets for Care came out in October, and he lives in Norwich with Helen Ivory. Helen Ivory is a poet and assemblage artist. Her, first, her fifth Blood Axe collection is The Anatomical Venus, and she's working on her next collection for Blood Axe entitled How to Construct a Witch. She edits the webzine Ink, Sweat, and Tears and teaches creative writing online at the University of East Anglia and the National Center for Writing. And she has work translated into Polish, Ukrainian, Spanish, and Croatian as part of the Versepolis project. Mark Vincenz is a poet, fiction writer, translator, editor, musician, and artist. He has published over 30 books of poetry, fiction, and translation. His recent poetry collections include The Little Book of Earthly Delights, There Might Be a Moon or a Dog, and 39 Wonders and Other Management Issues. His work has been published in The Nation, Washington Square Review, or Literature Today, The Los Angeles Review of Books, and many other journals. He is publisher and editor of Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing, and his collection, The Pearl Diver of Erinmani, is just out from White Pine Press. Now for some words. Um, the work of all three poets insists on otherness as a central, if not constitutive, part of selfhood and sociality. Ivory seductive yet threatening figures of the hysteric and the witch haunt the patriarchal cultural imaginary. Figura posits grief as a radically alternative mode of life, whether present in his own experience or in the double lives of NHS staff during the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, Vincenzo's animals and objects exude a force against the grain of human conceit that remain inextricable from humanity itself. All three poets then venture into those unknowns that shatter the dominant conception of the human subject, forcing us to reckon with our limits, but leaving us the room to play within them. And play it is from the panpsychist world of Vincennes, in which, quote, the tangible is all that counts, to figure those acrostic forms into the theatricality of Ivory's witches. Each poet turns sociality on its head by bringing to the surface its excluded othernesses, its repressed violences. Or as Ivory tells us with relation to her own work, quote, there is always a little bloodshed when a woman is born, unquote. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming these great poets tonight. Thank you so much for that, that kind introduction, which we'll try and live up to. Um, so I'm Martin. Can you hear me? I'm going to have to lower this a bit. Just... Loud as possible without shouting. Is that better? Can you hear? Or... Is that good? OK. OK, well, I'm going to start with a, a seasonal poem um, called Spring, which we seem to have bypassed and gone straight to summer today. I just thought I would have broken out the summer shirt and everything. Uh, and but um, a while ago, when the last Labour government, which is like kind of our Democrats, where it's its death throes, it started snowing in November and it was still snowing in April. So I thought this would, would be a good poem to just kind of warm things up. So this is spring. Snow keeps falling, though April's begun. The city is buried while we sleep in our beds and the councils run out of molasses and grit. People move through the streets like hospital patients, out for a smoke or a breath of fresh air, the onset of chillblains cracking their skin. The park is bereft of hopeful spring tulips and so are the verges and vases on sideboards. There's just enough power for a couple more weeks. What then? We'll start to burn tables and chairs, I suppose. A family in crampons takes the road into town for what tins are left on the shelves in the shops. Their faces are stung by the wind from the lake where anglers in pinstripes crouch over the ice, watching the city the other way up. And we did see a family in crampons walking into town. <laughs> True, I didn't make that up. So um, the introduction mentioned grief, so I'm going to go dark. 
but I've been I have to lift it to lightness by the end, otherwise it's unfair. <laughs> it, it's it's a difficult trick to pull off. I'm gonna do my best. So um, I'm gonna start with this uh, schoolroom in Upper Silesia, 1933. Um, so my show whistle, which is um, from this book, it was only when I was putting together the show, which has visuals and the soundscape. That there's this photograph of my father at school in Upper Silesia in 1933. And there are all these kind of urchins, there's about 49 of them. And, and it was only in doing a close edit on the computer, I noticed one boy was dressed with a sort of leather strap across his chest. And this is Upper Silesia near where Auschwitz was. And in that classroom, those 49 classrooms, um, those 49 kids, they look, you know, by the end of the war, they have been, I think my father was 10 at the time, nine. They'll have been in their early 20s and they'll all have had stories that it was, you know, there'll have been German and Polish children there um, from where it was. And some of them will have been Jewish. Um, and my father's just one of those stories, which um, gets quite dark. But this is schoolroom, Upper Silesia. In that moment when the shutter was pressed, no one looked away. So the camera held each luminous face in its gaze, kept them there, each grin lost look or open stare. 50 boys in rows with folded arms or hands in front, their grubby fingers curling over the rims of wooden desks. The master stands at the back, his hat on a peg by the door. He tells them that knowledge is wealth. My father looks out from the third row, chin raised and clear eyed, sure of himself, but there were things he couldn't know. The alphabet hangs on the wall, every underlined letter chanted until known well enough for words to come easy as beyond the door the first stones are thrown. One boy blinked and has given clouds for eyes. The smallest sits at the front and wears a dirty striped jacket. His face betrays that he already knows the use of words. The words on the streets are fire and murder. They ring clear against the tenement blocks and shop windows. The schoolmaster turns the key of a black music box. Its wooden bird rises from her burning nest, a voice as pure as a serious child black tie and leather strap across his chest, which rises and falls where his heart is held and beats quietly in a bed of soft ash. Its slow gray storm coats tongues, clogs nostrils and stings eyes. By the time they can wash, scrape it away from under their fingernails, they'll have become men of sorts, outgrown the classroom's hard benches and made their way, some in polished boots, some with triangles sewn on their shirts and nothing left to know. So Upper Silesia, where my father's right. Do you know the writer P.G. Woodhouse here? The English comic writer from the 90s. He was interned in Upper Silesia during the war. And he was quoted as saying, my God, if this is Upper Silesia, what must Lower Silesia be like? Uh, it's, it's very heavily industrialized and polluted. One of the most polluted places in Europe. Um, so this is coal. Cabins of Fire growl deep underground, crack open the contaminated surface so the murmur of voices can escape. The bones of dukes and peasants, bohemians, Prussians, Mongol raiders and Moravians are pressed tight into a fault line, this fault line as thin as a flag. The flag is the colour of blood cells. Behind the buckling crosses of window frames, old men are dismantling clocks on kitchen tables, looking for providence amongst cogs and spiders, and the black hills will join the sky and rain will pour down and bury this place. So um, war has a way of reaching down through generations and so hid in our family. So I'll just read this poem, which comes some 20 years after the end of the war. My mother, my father. My mother never met my father when 17, did not die at his hands at 32, because he never boarded the ship to Liverpool after the war. He went home to Bitham to recover on the wrong side of history. They walked separate lives down hobbled streets in the stunned aftermath where fate was blind and love letters never blazed across the firm stationery and time was dreary slow, a subterranean river until love struck in the alluvial dark sparked like flint for both of them so many miles apart 
I allow them only this coincidence to both marry on the selfsame day they never did. Franz Joseph Figura's face shone like a silver slotty behind his fine moustache. And June Evelyn McCulloch's face shone like half a crown beneath her veil. And happy ever after they were, each with many children, none of whom were me. I am someone else entirely. This was never written. My ne mother never met my father when 17, did not die at his hands at 32, because he never. Um, the news. So that's a new poem, which I thought I'd finished with this subject matter some years ago, and I've just suddenly started writing um, some, which I'm going to sort of read tonight. But this is one of the older poems, The News. The whole thing tips upside down at the news. Cups and saucers spin away, disappear into the infinite artex swirl. I am in the middle of the room, the centre of a small universe, equidistant, not just from the walls, but from the floor and ceiling too. I begin a slow, shadowless rotation through the silence. Heads are planets, the doctor's few thin hairs are rings of satin. Uncle Alan is the ginger sun, my sisters and I small lost moons. Auntie Margaret's cloud cover, Uncle Philip's oil fields, Father Lightbound's black jacket shouldering its own milky way. So me and my sisters were whisked away in this poem, this vanishing point. The rear window flickers into life as we pull away. The uncertain image of a boy on a bicycle appears. Behind him, a painted backdrop of the avenue. It's sycamore trees and pebble-dashed houses, piggots, Mitchells, Mrs. Donnelly's with all its confiscated footballs, her poodle yapping at the fence. Children's games are caught in midair at the height of their action. Uncle Philip turns onto the busy road. The boy pedals like mad to stay with us, but we stretch away, leave him stranded, disappearing. Then there is just white light and the loose flapping sound of a film end escaping its gate. I think I'll move us through a little bit to some of the new stuff. So, um, this is Dead Dad, which sounds quite a flippant title, but um, there's, a, there's a sculptor, Ron Muick. I don't know if you know him, but he does these lifestyle, uh, what sort of photorealist sculptures, so a baby's head with the size of this room and stuff. But he had a difficult relationship with his father, and after his father died, he made a, a sculpture of him in, in sort of the same kind of detail, but it was about the size of this desk, and it's on a low plinth, and it, it's kind of really kind of heartbreaking piece of work. And this is a quote from Ron Muir, um, with the actually from an interview with Craig Rain, the, the British poet. I didn't really get on with my father, but as I made the piece, I found myself thinking about him, caring. And one of the things about writing the book was I had to kind of walk in my father's shoes, um, which is always a good thing to do when, when you're kind of doing this kind of thing, I guess. Dead Dad, it's your son, the officer who drives an Audi. Your chest is a still field, your nipples lost pennies. Once when I visited you in the secure ward, there was a woman with no knickers curled up on a table. You laughed and if, asked if I had a girlfriend yet. You'd insisted mum convert to Catholicism. Has that proved worthwhile? If she's there with you now, are you forgiven? Give her my love. Does she mind your other wives? I hope there's beer, sausage, dumplings and sauerkraut. Perhaps an umpire band like the one you made us listen to. I'm nearly your dead age now. I never once saw you exercise and all those mixed grills. Ay, 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 ay. No wonder your chalk white legs are so skinny, your belly so soft. I'd been jealous of how you looked as a young man in that photograph of you on the beach just after the war. You're so small now, I could lift you on my arms as if I were the yellow forklift you drove backwards and forwards at the Chucky Chicken factory. Maybe the afterlife is not infinite, so we shrink to free up space. Why are your palms upturned? Are you tempting supplication? Have they let you in the choir? You used to sing me to sleep tunelessly, poor, poor Molly Malone and her wheelbarrow. I have a damaged tape of when we talked, tried to reach where sorrow and forgiveness meet. 
We sound underwater like Alfred Lord Tennyson reading the charge of the light brigade onto wax. I see the last thought on your face and my heart flies to you. Your German accent sounds heavier than I remember. Der Himmel ist der Haus. And uh, corresponding um, one, um, the boy who replaced his mother. The boy who replaced his mother with a stick he found and ran along the railings in the park by setting fire to the bandstand and watching from the dark by constructing her from Meccano with 27 moving parts by drawing her from memory on a mannequin in the window of a store by the Queen of Hearts flicking against the wheel spokes of his bike by shoplifting chocolate bars by bullying by telling jokes by keeping goal by showing off by saying fuck by by chiseling her from bog oak, by shaping her from shadow, play and smoke, by puddling rain softly in the small of his palm, by doing well, by singing badly, and by writing her in a book. So I'm not going to attempt to lighten the mood. Um, with, um, so um, I never saw, I was nine years old when my mother died, so I never really knew her when I was an adult, and I'd never seen her as an adult, so I kind of imagine that was just something that was entirely lost. But then we were at a, a party a few years ago, and Helen wears kind of vintage clothes, as do kind of some of our friends and me occasionally. So we're at this party, it was a really foggy night in a small room, smaller than this, and people were coming out of the fog into this sort of lit room. And I had this flashback to 50 years ago, a memory that I, well, I didn't know I had. That's something that happened that I'd completely forgotten about. A New Year's party I'd been allowed to stay up for uh, as a little boy, as an eight-year-old. And, and I'd seen my mother partying on into the night. And, and I was also, I don't know if you do it here, but on um, first footing on New Year's Eve, someone with dark hair gets to bring a piece of coal through the back door to herald good luck for the coming year. So um, this is about that, which was kind of really threw me that night. I was just completely sort of banjaxed by the whole business. So um, New Year Redux. Each guest slips from fog and through the door like a softly lit movie star and casts adrift the new built houses opposite the call centres, the inner ring roads constant hum. And this little room is warm and bright with party dresses and men with quips in baggy suits and in the bedroom up above where all the faux fur coats are chucked. The radio's clock flips back and back and above the roof, above the fog, stars are streaks across the sky and above all that, beehives glow like standard lamps and Louis Prima swings and jokes are spilt and someone shouts, fetch me a blousy woman now and his wife throws a scarf around his neck, kisses him loose upon the mouth and from our mouths, if you knew Susie like I know Susie, oh, 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 what a girl and in the yard fog is smoke and smoke is breath and cigarettes are shooting stars and through the misted windows blur, is that my mother? gap tooth grin my aunts and uncles counting down and is this me at the back door a lump of coal gripped in my fist so that's that so we're moving on to other things um i think i'll do oh, that one this one right um so um i got <laughs> uh, commission to um to write a poem uh there's this art exhibition um in in norwich and so i got to write about a jillian waring she's um video artist sculptor kind of artist and she recorded two boys talking about her mother um uh, and then she recorded the mother talking about her sons and then she reversed them so it looked like the mother was speaking the boy's words and the boys were speaking the mother's words and the, the father wasn't given a voice but he's very much there in in the subtext of everything that was said so this is largely kind of found words and it's in the form of a specular i don't know if you if you have them over here which is sort of so it kind of poem works its way down to the middle and then line by line works its way back to the start and changes the meaning slightly uh, really difficult to write and this is the only one i've done so um failure and it's in the mother's voice. 
He loves me, I suppose. I am a failure. There's a better way of doing things. I am a dramatic woman. I know I think too much of myself and I should be submissive, a proper wife. He's very caring, really. He says, I like to be dominated. When he's jealous, he's abusive towards me. I'm afraid I won't grow old. I sometimes tell him that. He's beautiful looking. He will try and tell me about love, but hate is something he needs and I don't. He says I am a failure and I don't. He says I am a failure, but hate is something he needs. Try and tell me about love. He's beautiful looking. He will grow old. I sometimes tell him that he's abusive towards me. I'm afraid I won't be dominated when he's jealous. He's very caring, really. He says, I like to be submissive, a proper wife. I think too much of myself and I should. I am a dramatic woman. I know there's a better way of doing things. I suppose I am a failure. He loves me. Thank you. How am I doing? Five minutes. Okay. Um, what am I going to do? I'm going to do this and then another one or two, depending on how it goes. So I have, I'm fortunate enough to have a daughter with Down syndrome and she's magnificent and unreasonable. Um, and we think she might have irritable Down syndrome, but she's also had this sequence of lovers since she was this big. And as a father, I'm pleased to say they're all cartoons. And, um, and she's 40 next in a few weeks time. And this is Amy's lovers. It's not enough to love them. She must climb into their skins and wear them like pajamas. Spiderman Sam just now has been for a couple of years. She wonders that pyromaniacal valley town with matches in her backpack. She'll smoke out the hero inside herself. Hit rewind again and again. Can't get enough of his tune or his merchandise. It's as if Springfield never happened until 6 p.m. when she turns Sam off for Channel 4, taps her fingertips together and is Mr. Charles Montgomery Burns. She has his shaky walk down pat and mimics his villainous laugh while Sam pretends to polish his axe. He knows it's not the last Lothario, though, but the next. Some new kid, all pixels on the big screen at the multiplex. A cheap toy with her Big Mac, then it's shopping for DVDs, utility belts and action figures, and his heart's a stone. Out west, Woody tips back his hat, squints through the haze of all the years since Shaggy turned up in his mystery machine, and she began to dress in brown and green and left her sheriff badge to tarnish. But Woody was first and best and bides his time. Toy Stories 2 and 3 went by, but he's pretty sure when 4 comes out, she'll mosey into town wearing her cowskin waistcoat, shout, yee-haw, Woody, as if she's never been gone. I'm going to finish with just a... I've been writing poems about political leaders from the... long ago, mostly from the 70s to bring in a, a younger audience to my reading. It's going very well. Uh, this is Richard Nixon, who I won't explain to you. <laughs> um, I'll just, um, so the idea is to kind of reduce them to small human stories. So this is um, Richard Nixon speaks at his own funeral. My only friends dressed in black and carried walkie talkies. I never saw their eyes, just myself reflected back buttoned into a respectable coat and five o'clock shadow, named after a king, born on a fault line, I learned young to keep my voice low in an argument, to rise in darkness, put in a hard day before the world wakes up. Life can turn like a polecat or skunk. This is the house my father built and lost in 22. Here are the graves of the brothers who never made it through. As a child, I breathed cold air into the spongy maze of my lungs and held it there. You'd have to cut me open, prise apart my ribcage to find scar tissue. I loved a quiet woman who knew how to sit through the night. I wept into my handkerchief when she died. Women who talk dirty are worse than kites or commies. The past is a smoking gun and my face marred by dust and sweat and blood. I've spoken to men on the moon about peace, done what I've done for the good of my country, standing cold rain to pay your respects. 
I gave them a sword, those sons of bitches. They stuck it in and twisted. Wire taps and dirty tricks are just curveballs and switches. My only friends dress in black and carried walkie talkies. Thanks so much for listening to me. I'm going to finish there because I've done my time. I'm fine now. Now I'm a lot shorter, so we're going to have to <laughs> going to have to do something with this. Shall I move it from there or from the? Thank you. Okay. Hello. Good. Hello, everyone, and hello, everyone online as well. Um, so I'm very pleased to be reading from um, Wunderkammer, which is my new and selected poems brought out by Mark from Madhouse Press and Madhouse. So I'm so sorry, wow. Madhouse. <laughs> I, know, I know what it is, Wait, maybe. Anyway. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, it's it's kind of my life's work. Um, so I'm going to read the first poem as, but by way of introduction, or a few poems actually, um, from um, Waiting for Bluebeard, which is the first half of the book is based on my childhood. And the second half of the book is living with someone who I have come to call Bluebeard. Um, so he was an abusive person and you don't find out at the beginning, it kind of, it, it grows. Um, so I've never called him by his actual real name. Um, so anyway, let, let, yeah, so it's a kind of an examination of how a person, you know, comes to be living in Bluebeard's house. So, so I was born in 1969, the year of the moon landing, and this poem is Moon Landing. Somewhere beyond weather, Men are reckoning the acreage of space and playing tricks on gravity. My pregnant mother watches with the millions on their front wings as she waits that I will not budge. Meanwhile, the men, wrapped inside their skins, trust their lives to science and whatever wonder brought them there. The suitcase has been packed for days. All the clothes are white or lemon. A man plays hopscotch on the moon. Now, some of the things uh, we really can't hear you voice. cannot hear me. Okay, um, what do we do about this? Um, do I talk louder? Do I stand on my toes? <laughs> Get closer to the okay, okay. All right, all right, here we go. Um, tell, tell me, is that better? Cool, cool, cool. Um, so okay, another birth poem, but this time a little, um, a, a little kind of yeah I'll explain um firstborn after a picnic in the park my mother gave birth to an egg at the hospital they placed it in an incubator and the midwives held vigil her mother said it was a tuna paste being off and didn't believe the fanciful story involving the swan and the roundabout on the day of the hatching, the sun rose as usual, and my grandmother took her customary bus to the hospital with grapes and Lucas aid. The next day, my mother took her bundle home, oblivious to the entourage of swans massing in the sky above the bus. The baby looked like any other newborn. That's what I remember of the situation so basically right my, so my parents shouldn't have been married and this is an example of that Sunday morning it all comes back to the breakfast table still set in the middle of a room which has become so vast and arid you would need a camel train to cross it her father has turned himself altogether into wallpaper and is rolling further and further up the wall away from the sidewinders in the carpet. There is a Sunday smell of washing powder and a glimpse of her mother's back as she pegs out uniforms in the oasis of green in the far corner. She is doing her best to spoon marmalade onto her toast, but it is molten in the desert sun. A solitary crumb falls from the table and a snake sidles over all eyes. Is this all right now? Can you hear me? Okay, another thing. So my so my father was a very strange person. Um, so my two fathers. 
When my father removes his skin, he steps to one side and tidies the old skin away with a dustpan and brush. He wants nothing more than not to make a spectacle, but my mother insists he fill it with stones. The stone father is anchored to the armchair while the other goes upstairs to his room in a sulk. The stone father holds a television control, orchestrates the night's entertainment. The other stays asleep like a bear. We saw a bear the other day. Saw one in the museum today. Um, so, so, th so this poem um, is in the middle between the childhood and the going into Bluebeard's house, and it's based on um, there's a little sculpture um, called the House of Thorns by Alice Meyer, and um, it's a very cute little kind of plywood house, tiny, and it's it's covered in thorns, so it looks cute, and you want to pick it up, but obviously thorns. So this is a, a, um, a little sequence. The House of Thorns. It takes no more than a word for a flame to stir in its womb, for smoke to rise and push at the walls like a trapped and injured beast. There is no chimney, no window, no glass of air. So the fire that's grown too big for the hearth will die before it eats up the room. Here is a bed for the wolf. Here is a chair burst at the seams. Here's the little pot that will cook and cook and cook. It's hard to imagine a path from this house when you can't imagine a door. The roof is braced against all four winds. You're swaddled inside a coat of thorns. There are stories about spring mornings, about dew-soaked grass, the signature of your footsteps, you the only child on earth. The house is blind to romance, makes you pin down your tongue, rocks you till you fall asleep. Hush your by, hush your by, hush your by. When the seeds are planted and the roses are grown mature enough for a harvest of thorns and all of the effort of building a home, tattoos meet scratches on your parents' hands. Now think of a house. Think of another house, a house of your own cut from the cloth of your very own skin. The thought rises up like a singing clock, its bird constructed of feathers and springs. Now, inside Bluebeard's hands, um, that, so that, there's a sequence of poems that go through um, called The Disappearing, where um, the I becomes a she as I watch myself vanish. Um, it's a way of kind of writing about that. Um, so this is the first one, the disappearing. The tariff for crossing the threshold was a single layer of skin. She imagined a snake unzipping itself in one deft move. She imagined herself live inside the house, her new home. She didn't imagine the scarring, nor the painstaking care required to leave the ghost of herself on the doorstep like a cold caller. Okay, so Bluebird tried to change things about me. <laughs> so this is the first thing, at the dress shop. At the dress shop, the assistants bustle as Bluebird watches from an ornate chair. She has phoned, he, he has phoned ahead and they come at her with his choices all prim on wire hangers. She parades of him and so do all the other women in the mirrors. Everyone looks older than her. She imagines being animated by Mybridge, the drabbest dress painted onto her body, bluebeard at the handle of the zoetrope, she's spinning too fast for herself. This is my last one I'll read from this book. So yeah, this is further on in The Disappearing. I mean, obviously I escaped from Bloomy's house here and that. So um, this is The Disappearing Five. Each day a new bird skin appeared on the patio, emptied of its heart and bones and singing. Perhaps it was the owl's meticulous work. When she'd harvested enough skins, she sat at her table one morning and fashioned herself a birdskin coat. 
And when she put it on, the uncured hide grafted easily to her own skin. And when she tried to sing, she could not. But I can now. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to read some poems from a chapbook um, called Maps of the Abandoned City. And in it, I imagine that humans have built up a city and then just left it. I, I wrote it before the pandemic and before the lockdowns when our streets did, were actually there. Um, so this is the first poem in that, in that sequence. In a time before maps. Long ago. When the city was an infant, it lay on its back on a big white sheet, transfixed by the tiny articulations of its own small hands. Constellations of eyes beheld from the sky, the city grew vivid, grew hearty, grew schools and grew graveyards. And when these were replete, it grew more. Straw begat sticks, then sticks begat brick. So the wolf packed its bags and decamped to the forest. The city sprouted a gate and then locked it. Even the city became lost in those days, took itself for a wander inside its own head and simply vanished. Something had to be done. The cartographer stepped from a fold in the sky. So I have a character called the cartographer who comes with the pink, and this is her first invention. The cartographer invents herself. Thunder loped across the sky's wilderness and clouds stumbled around then fixed upon an almost shape. The cartographer feels her hands for the first time, lifts them to her face and expertly moulds her own eyes. She draws the roads that will carry her blood and the pathways to order her ribcage, then hollows out the playground for her breath. So if there's no people in the city, then the mirrors will get very hungry because there is nothing going on. The hungry mirrors. The mirrors of the abandoned city are hungry as hungry can be. At least the lakes have a belly full of sky. At least the ponds are heavy with livestock. These days, it's drawn blinds, empty changing rooms, and the chirruping crickets they have no ears for. Once, a spider hauled itself down by a thread, and they gorged on it frantically like someone lost in the desert. Ah, oh, those starveling servants of vanity, we must pity them in their lean days, when all eternity is an empty greatcoat in the maw of an unlit corridor. I shall move on. Um, actually, I'll read um, this this one. It comes towards um, the end of um, Maps of the City. And I heard something about um, people training birds, like crows and those kinds of animals to clean up after us, you know, just clearing, cleaning up the trash. And um, this is where this comes from, the birds. During the final days of those final days, the city gate was propped open for stragglers, dragging their suitcases through windy streets, civilizations, chip wrappers jamming their wheels. And then a rustling of a million feathers as all the sky's birds put their shoulder to the gate and closed it as if closing a tomb. A whirlwind of litter baffled about the city until a crow with one blue eye rose, gave an ushering call, and thence the assembly swooped. For days, for six days and six nights, they worked with unstinting precision to garner each cast off wrapping, each scuttling drink can, each mocking fragment of plastic. On the seventh day, urged on by the crow, they conjured a structure from this debris, a structure surpassing any man made fabrication. A nest, a glorious nest, reaching out to the high heavens. I'm just going to read you a few newer poems. So I'm writing about witches at the moment, and I have been writing about witches for a few years. Yeah, I um, So um, the yeah, I, I kind of um, this poem is about um, 
it being a certain point in in my life and in a lot of people's life when they're suddenly thinking and talking about witches. So this poem is a, a prose poem and it's called The Waking. I have become one of those women who goes about with a rattan carriage, salvaging women buried at crossroads or planted out in the woods. One of those women who reconstructs bodies replacing ligaments with wire. The kind who mixes her own blood with the earth to bring swell to their bones. The kind of woman who tarries with a devil in the naughty light of day. Why must we be occult? I hold up those rekindled women and we reel, we howl and we shoot our filthy mouths off. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, so. Um, I'll read you two more. Thank you very much for listening to me. I know it's unbearably hot. Um, so this one, oh yeah, talking about unbearably hot, you know, hormones. Um, let's go there. <laughs> Part of my witch thing is, is like, you know, different ages of different ages of the witch, you know, you're a hot young witch or you're hag. Um, so this is heading towards the hag, the change. You sit inside yourself and your body does its thing. One minute it's a honey pot of oestrogen, the next the head you had grown with is a crucible and the, and the words flushes and flashes don't touch the sides of this urge to run clear of this body. The clothes in your wardrobe carry a wisp of mutton from a source buried deep inside language. You smear lady danger on muttony chops and everywhere advice on how to hide your arms. Heaven forfend you make a spectacle of your collagen depletion. Every night your hormones throw a party you don't want to attend, messing with the levels like a bad DJ. You read that tinnitus is affected by oestrogen's jitterbug, then not enough research has been done. Your skin is a rubber doll plumped up with lava that stumbled into a cold store at 4 a.m. So finally, um, so uh, my research has taken me all over the place, but um, watching films is one of my things. Um, so this is from um, The Wizard of Oz and the title um, from Glinda the Good, who says, only bad witches are ugly. So do you like from the skies in the blush of a bubble your gown all glimmered with stars? Or does the earth spew you forth in a wretch of red smoke? Are you more peaches and cream or frog in a quagmire, opiate stoned in a cradle of poppies or rattled awake in the dash of a blizzard? Are you gooder than good in a basket of good, unbinding the bad with your charming white wand? Or is your scandalous body the root of your power? Are you a good witch or are you a bad witch? <laughs> We have to go through the microphone readjustment situation. That's a little too, a little too high, a little bit better. Good. So tonight I'm going to read you from my new book, The Pearl Diver of Iramani, which is a kind of, well, it's an oceanic journey, obviously. Um, and it was, you know, it's, it started through the death of my mother, uh, led me through my own uh, illnesses and out the other side. This is called Forlorn Until Noon. Briefly sad, the grasses drooping, staring at their roots, bowed under the current, as if in wishing to say what they would have liked to, the tears have gathered at the tips of their questioning heads. As if flowers ask questions. Sea mist. Names drawn and objects out of nothing. The shadow light in our bones. The promise of music through the hourglass. The light within the light. Space shapes. That falling heart smothered in silence. A bird coasting alone on the wind, waiting for language to arrive. The ruins of the night, torn 
tattered, veiled, unveiled, distant Märchen. Voices on the far side, blue glances, splintered evergreens, deception. Future's heroism in love with words, small hours, ferocious void, instinct, desire, animal rhythm. Embrace it and the other spaces full of noise, that utterance of flight turning into water. Filled out with moonlight. A grazing of dust in this tranquil quilted time, eyes unseen, unknown, sea slugs and curled snails moving into slow postured mastery, veritably uniform, formed in union, coming into darkness, a heavier substance, the substrate of the skies of planets, suns, space beyond space. The concept of conception. So we're starting to get into the quantum here. And then we come back to reality as money flaunts the good star. Boldly in that rumbling bottleness, a tender filigree, attuned to the unison of mothers and daughters, a sound of bubbling felicity as the grand curtain rises. A second similar counterpart that's been carried over, four voices out of the storm, naming a few things for themselves. Those buzzards circling the carrion, the broad-handed undertaker clicking, clicking his tongue. Look at the lavender curls, the bodies quivering like mercurial fluid moving toward those overgrown hands and the flickering of the candle. On the nightstand, everything made visible again. Wheels of industry. Light turns blue, turns old. The gears and cogs roar. Nailed to clouds, the dying float above. Drained. We emerge from stained glass among the trees, raising arms, singing as the dust rises, the sky falls, and the grain nestles in our pockets. Karma. How the birds have stopped singing, how the green has become gray. How your last words resonate, this is the very thing you are. A short note from the heart, I could still hear his laughs from where while reading at the kitchen lamp, the night was windowless and the words split apart as the house fly drilled into the cracks. But there was grace here in its silent voluptuousness, bearing down upon my breast like an ocean ignorant, old, and preserving, and hunched I walked the narrow passage into the dreams of my dreams, afraid of what it meant to be orphaned or to be departed, or the money spent on acquiring identity, and the light that louvers in the I do, in the shuffling of thought be between the latter and the former, and the fate of family or the smell of consequence in all its sizes, flooded in impartial stares, how the near-sighted cloud in the pain has little fear of the unknown, and the illusion of will in the small gentle order recalls the belligerent, the delinquent, the crushed genes of atomic time, where such small quarry was the pastime of lesser gods, of forest spirits or water fry where the sky forks away and we were reborn again every second Sunday among the birds. And one more from also another recent book, 39 Wonders and Other Management Issues to end with somewhat of a hopeful note. 
ritual. Nonsensical to pass through each house to clear the air of ghosts by ringing a rusty temple bell. The light of the April day scorns your true beauty. Even when my heart is at an angle, the sun elevates. Hold out your hands and spin in a circle dervishly. Of course, you are adored by the dreamers and the love you seek will be poured upon you. In time, the fellowships of ancient societies fade. The spirits in all their kindred fallacies too. All the senses in the grain of the wood, deep in the structure. And when it has been struck by lightning, the scarred grief holds us by our feet. Tenuous, an old man traversing rocks in a flowing stream. I'd love to be able to lie to you, but my hands reveal all. The fire of that kiss from forever, the storm that raised the cornfields, the bounties unleashed in the rain. Ashes, on the other hand, can be deceiving. For now, let us just stroll into the distance where the sun flies low along this plot of land. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, everyone. Um, if we could get another round of applause for these fantastic poets. Um, and so we will have books for sale and poets will be signing. And um, if everyone could put their chairs against the wall, that'd be great. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think I want to go to the function. I'm going 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 to